Welcome, and thank you for watching the Spirit Life Church Milwaukee video cast. This is Pastor Tom Wilkie, and on behalf of Pastors Lori and Laurel Wilkie, we pray that you are blessed and encouraged with the teaching of the Word of God. Open your heart now to receive a transforming message that will strengthen and inspire you to become all God has called you to be. And now, here is Pastor Laurel Wilkie with today's message. I am Laurel, which is, uh, I'm Pastor Tom and Lori's daughter. So, and on occasion, I have been doing a series called Undercover, um, which I think is very needed in this hour. I, I really believe it is. I, I mean, if anything, I need it. <laughs> so I enjoy receiving from what I study as I prepare these messages. But it's called Undercover, and you think, well, what is Undercover? What are we, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Well, it's a series in which we're dealing with what the Bible has to say about a somewhat controversial topic, although he doesn't think it's controversial, but some people in the world might believe it is, and that is the topic of authority. Authority. Authority figures, the, the whole idea of what authority is, how we're supposed to relate to it, uh, what the Bible says about it in particular. That's what we want to know. <laughs> not, not my opinion about it. My opinion doesn't matter. It's what the Bible says about it that matters. And so that's what this series has been about. And if maybe you've... Uh, Maybe this is your first time here, or you've never had a chance to hear one of this one of the one of the installments in this series. They're all on our channel, and you can go back. And there's this is actually the sixth one so far. It's been a lot of them that we've been doing, but uh, this is the sixth one. So all all the other five are on the YouTube channel. You can go and watch it, and I encourage you to do that because it uh, even if you've maybe heard them before, go back and listen to them again because. Sometimes, even when I listen to messages, I hear other things the second time I hear it. So I encourage you to do that. But today, we're going to move forward and discuss some things today, because we've learned, I'm going to do a little recap here for y'all. We've learned that in order to submit to any earthly authority, you must first establish the principle of submitting to God's authority, because he is the ultimate authority, all right? He is the ultimate authority, and when any of us sin, actually, it's an act of rebellion against the authority of God. That's actually what sin is. It's, it's, I mean, some people think it's sin and like, oh, well, what is sin? Well, it's actually the, the idea of sin is really rebellion against the authority of God. God calls it lawlessness, according to 1 John 3, 4. And so whether you know it or not, you're actually going to serve somebody. People who don't serve God may not think, that, you know, they might not agree with that, they think that maybe they're their own master. But actually, that's not true. If you're not serving God, you're actually serving the devil. If you don't you know, if you don't know it, I'm going to... There's a news flash for you today. If you're not serving God, you're serving the devil. So I, I highly encourage you to serve God. He's a much better master. <laughs> but the delusion probably comes, though, because when we satisfy the desires of the flesh, there's that immediate gratification. But the Bible tells us that... The end is death, all right? And you can see it played out somewhat, somewhat in the world. You see people who never, you know, they live their whole life and they don't serve God and, you know, you see things happening in their life that, you know, maybe their health degrades or their family falls apart or their finances are, you know, in ruins and they just end up, and even if maybe none of those things happen, their end is destruction in eternity. They don't go to heaven. And so that is the ultimate death. So to serve the devil will only lead to death and destruction throughout your earthly life and eternal separation from God afterwards. But to serve God, while it may seem more challenging in certain situations, it actually brings life and blessing. So, amen. <laughs> amen, I agree. So we have to establish the concept, though, that God is the divine authority. Only then can we begin to see the need to submit to earthly authorities. And one of our keynote scriptures has been Romans 13, 1 through 7. And we can put that on the screen because we're going to read it again because <laughs> it's so good. Uh, Romans 13, 13, not Romans 3, Romans 13, 1 through 7. So you can just switch that out if it's up there. It should be on the screen, but if not, you can just listen to it. 
But listen as I read this. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Whoever resi- who, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. This is, this is not me. This is, this is a verse here. <laughs> For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. I love this. God's minister. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister. That's the second time that he said that. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. And I think last time I read this, I went, taxes? Talking about taxes now? (laughs) Yeah, he's talking about taxes. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers, the third time, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. And honor to whom honor. Wow. So when you know that God is the ultimate authority, you see that all authority actually comes from him. So when you resist an authority figure, you're, you're resisting what God has established. And according to this verse, you will, quote, bring judgment on yourself. And these are the words of scripture. They're not mine. They're not my own. So all authority structures and positions are of God. However, as we can see around us, Not all people who hold those positions are godly. Yet we have spoken of the fact that God can take the evil actions of an authority figure. We used in a previous message the example of Pharaoh from the Old Testament. And he can take, God can take those actions from that authority figure and use them for our ultimate good and for the glory of God to be revealed among his people. So God even actually said this to Pharaoh, because we know Pharaoh, I mean, he, was, he did not serve God, not at all. All right, but God said this to Pharaoh in Exodus 9, 16. He said, but indeed for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. That's what he said to Pharaoh. This is the guy who was like killing people and doing hor- He said, yo, Pharaoh. I have raised you up, actually, that I am going to show my power through you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. So Pharaoh was a very ungodly man, yet through this we see that God himself raised Pharaoh up for his divine purposes. This is rather hard to wrap our heads around. I mean, it's, it's, something, it's something we have to have humility about, trusting in the Lord about this and being confident of his promise that God is working something glorious. And we've spoken about how to overcome unfair treatment. That was my last message. About how to overcome injustice from authorities. As, and we, you know, I showcased the life of David in particular with his, uh, his authority, which was King Saul. He entrusted himself into the care of God, not taking judgment into his own hands. Unfortunately, not everyone responds to leadership as David did. Too often we delight in seeing defects in our authorities and then we feel justified to then you know throw off restraint but our response to the sins of others especially those who are leaders is one of the greatest indicators of our spiritual maturity okay this being the case god often uses the faults and mistakes of authorities in our lives to expose true conditions of our hearts okay we see how this happened in my first example. In, it's in the life of Noah and his sons. Okay? Some of you may have never heard this story before. Some of you may have. But after the flood, all right, this was after the famous ark, and you know, Noah built the ark, and yay. Well, he actually did continue to live after that. He did some other things. <laughs> so after the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground. He had to probably plant some crops, and he planted a vineyard. All right, and one day, from his produce, from his vineyard, 
uh, he obviously had some wine, and so he began to drink, and he began to drink a little too much and got drunk. Okay, this is Noah. He drinks, he gets drunk, he got really drunk, and he retired to his tent, and in his drunkenness, he actually, sorry, he took all his clothes off and was naked in his house. That's what happened, okay? And he just passed out. And so Ham, all right, he had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And Ham, the youngest of his sons, just walked into the tent, you know, didn't know anything weird was happening. And he saw his dad, Noah, laying there. And he just probably like, went like, oh my gosh, you know. And he went outside and told his two brothers. And Shem and Japheth, you know, he, he, he might have said, guys, dad is like drunk as a skunk and naked as a jaybird in there. <laughs> You got to see him. He's like plastered in there and he's totally nude. I mean, what, you know, he's probably just, you know, he, he was, he could have, you know, you can use your imagination, elaborate however you want to. He went out and told his brothers about this situation. So, but when Shem and Japheth heard the story about this, all right, this is fascinating what they did. They took a garment, probably maybe a, a piece of like a blanket or some type of garment, and they held it over their shoulders while walking backwards into the tent, all right, with their faces turned away from their father. And when they got in there, they just covered his nakedness with a blanket. And then they left. You know, they didn't, they didn't even want to look at their father's shame. They took a blanket and just walked in, and they just covered him, and then they left. Now, once Noah woke up from his drunken stupor, he realized what had happened to him and also to what Ham had done as well as his sons. And hear what Noah proclaimed, and it's from Genesis 9, 25 to 27. And listen as I read this. Then he cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. And this is what he said. May Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. And then Noah said, May the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed, and may Canaan be his servant. May God expand the territory of Japheth, and may Japheth share the prosperity of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So Ham dishonored his father, showing contempt for God's delegated authority on Noah, who was his authority, his father, which brought a curse on Ham's generation. Canaan was his son, so it was on his whole generation. And it was a horrible, horrible thing. And Ham, it was interesting that Ham's sin, though, brought none of the severe consequences on him. Or, excuse me, it's interesting that Ham's sin brought severe consequences on him, while Noah's drunkenness brought none of the consequences of that sin, that are recorded, at least. Now, the moral failure of Noah became a test to his three sons, revealing the heart of each of them. It really did. One was rebellious and foolish, and two were honorable and merciful. Noah obviously did not set the best example with his drunkenness, yet his behavior was God's to deal with, not those under him. Two of the sons understood this and continued to honor him, even doing what they could to help their father's situation. The other son, Ham, though, took matters into his own hands to dishonor and shame his father, using his speech and his words to openly shame and expose his father's error. And he brought upon his own life and family the very curse that he thought his dad was going to get. So Shem and Japheth would not, would not as so much look at their father's failure. They didn't want to observe or to follow their, or, you know, or, or, or let their mind follow in what Ham was doing. They didn't even want their wives or children to see his condition. They covered it. They, they protected his position and their, and, their, and their own hearts in the process. And Ham, however, he just, he mocked, he discredited his father, and this provided Ham with an excuse to disobey his father even when he so desired, because that's kind of what it does. This is true of anyone when insubordination dwells in their heart. And by disqualifying authority, they feel released from submission to that authority then. And this is really interesting because in God's hall of fame listed in Hebrews 11, God actually boasts about Noah's faith and obedience. But we don't find Ham listed anywhere. But now think about it. Wasn't Ham right 
when he reported about his father? Ham didn't, like, you know, make up, make up this story here. He was 100% right in what he reported. Yet he was 100% wrong in his principle. Reasoning would justify his actions, though. He repeated only what he had seen. He was only being truthful. Yet there were, he were, you know, the principles of obedience and reverence say otherwise. Shem and Japheth honor, honored their father, and they were blessed. Many, like Ham, are accurate in what they report about leaders, yet they are wrong in God's eyes. They have dishonored another and lost their blessing. They live in the foolishness of their own understanding and reasoning. I know that's a hard word, but it is what it is. And I mentioned in my last message about when King Saul died that David didn't rejoice, all right? Because if you haven't read about it, David encountered severe mistreatment and injustice from Saul. I mean, he was chased like a criminal. He was uh, attemptedly tried to be killed by Saul. You know, so you would think that when King Saul finally met his end, that David would be like, oh, thank you, Jesus, you know, uh, glad that guy's, you know, deceased. But he didn't rejoice up about this. He didn't say, you know, wow, that guy finally got what he got coming to him after all he did to me. You know, on the contrary, he actually wrote a love song about Saul. It, it, it's, it's incredible. He wrote it, and you can read it in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 1. It's, it's, it's beautiful. He writes the song of honor and, and talks about all the good things that were in his leader. And, and this was all written by David, who suffered severe hardship at, at the hands of, of Saul. So nat, but you know, natural understanding and carnal reasoning would have encouraged him to rejoice and to proclaim victory. Yet David proved he lived by the principle of authority. And his example communicated this to the men under his own authority. And as a result, he became a great leader in the kingdom. And this is so important to know. It's that those who honor authority walk, walk in great authority. And respect will follow them. They have attracted the blessing of God. Those who revile authority or lightly esteem authority actually sow a harvest of disrespect and cause judgment to follow them. I, I heard uh, someone say this one time that, you know, it was, he was speaking to parents and he said, you know, you know oh, you, you parents, you know, you're so frustrated that your kids aren't respecting you. You know, and he goes, well, are they hearing you disrespect other authorities? You know, do, do they hear you sitting and, you know, slandering, you know, your boss or, or uh, cutting down the, you know, the governor or whatever? I mean, why would they, why would they want to honor you when you're not honoring authority? It, it's an important thing to consider. And let's consider another story that shows this. We see something that transpired in the life of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now, Miriam was Moses' older sister, okay? And God actually called her a prophetess, according to Exodus 15, 20. And Aaron was the older brother of Moses. So you've got two older siblings going on here, right? <laughs> two older siblings. And Aaron was also the high priest. So we're speaking about two people with significant spiritual gifts, all right, and positions among the people of Israel. And let's see what happens in Numbers 12, 1. We can put that on the screen if you have it, and you can read along. We'll just start with verse 1. While they were at Hazroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. All right, stop. You think, where is this going? I have no idea what's happening here. <laughs> so Miriam and Aaron, they take issue with this woman that Moses has married. All right, and you think, well, what's the big deal with the Cushite? Well, a Cushite is a native or inhabitant of the ancient land of Cush, identified by most scholars as current-day Ethiopia. All right, so this woman was not a descendant of Abraham, and therefore she was outside of the covenant God had established with Abraham. And Miriam and Aaron believed Moses had, at the best, made a bad decision by marrying someone who was not in that sphere. And were they correct in their opinion? Well, Yes, actually, if you go according to the letter of the law at the, in the Old Covenant, God had made known his desire for the children of Israel to marry only among themselves, 
Okay? He warned that foreign wives would draw away their hearts to foreign gods. And this command was given in Deuteronomy. So for Moses to marry a foreigner seemed like a contradiction to what, you know, God had revealed to Moses himself. But an important note here, I do want to interject, is to realize that today, under Jesus' new covenant, our only command about marriage is not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. So it is no longer a natural bloodline issue, but a spiritual one. Okay, we can see this in Galatians 3.28. So now it's not, it's perfectly fine now for two people of different ethnic groups to marry, according to the New Testament. But according to the Old Covenant, Miriam and Aaron were actually very right in their assessment. All right, again, not the case now, but back then, yes, it was. So yet their response here is where their error was. Moses was their leader, and criticizing him was out of order. As an older brother and sister, they could have discussed it as a family matter with him privately and in a spirit of humility, but to gossip among themselves and to discuss his behavior publicly with the congregation was an absolute sin. So you, you might think, what gave them the fuel to speak against their leader, Moses, like this? Well, the answer is found in the next verse, and let's see in Numbers 12, verse 2. They said, this is what Miriam and, verse, uh, verse 2, and they said this. This is what Miriam and Aaron said. This is what gave them the fuel for this. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? But the Lord heard them. Ha <laughs> ha, I like that phrase. But the Lord heard them. It's kind of like, God's like, I heard that. <laughs> so Miriam and Aaron spoke out in a way to bring down the authority of Moses and magnified the gifting in themselves in order to justify their response to the situation. I love how the Bible notes, but the Lord heard them. Another, another translation of that actually reads, and the Lord heard it. It's like, and the Lord heard it. The Lord's listening. <laughs> Remember that thought for later. Now had Moses spoken, or excuse me, not Moses, now had God spoken through Miriam and Aaron? Absolutely. God referred to Aaron as Moses' spokesperson or prophet. And Aaron spoke the messages of God to Pharaoh. And, and then you have Miriam, who was used to bring forth a prophetic psalm that we still have in the scriptures. So yes, God had spoken through them. They were mightily used of God. Yet their error was in viewing their spiritual gifts or abilities above the position of appointed authority. Okay? They had reasoned that since Moses had done something wrong, and they hadn't, of course, that Moses was no longer qualified as an authority over them, and they had the right to criticize. They allowed their spiritual gifting to elevate themselves above the authority that God had placed over them. I've read this verse before, but let's look at it again. It's in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, so, that, so through this verse, we see that authority flows through the offices, not the gifts. Okay? According to Matthew 28, 18, Jesus was given all authority from his Father after his resurrection. And then Jesus, in turn, gave the fivefold ministries as designated from the passage we just read in, in Ephesians. We must keep before us the fact that a person can be more gifted than a leader. For example, we'll just use an example of a pastor. Maybe you're more gifted than your pastor, yet the pastor stands in the office of authority and, then, and that means that they are over that gifted person. And this can apply to other categories of authority as well. Employees with employers, you know, that's a great example too. Maybe you're a lot more gifted than your boss, but your boss is still your boss. <laughs> all right? Some people feel very gifted in an area, maybe to minister to people, all right? Yet they never come under submission to a spiritual authority. And I know this isn't taught a lot, so just keep your heart open here. But I, I really feel this, is, feel this is on the on the heart and mind of God to share, all right? These people, they maybe reason out, you know, reason this out by observing the fact that, you know, well, well, God's using me to speak and minister to his people, you know. But if that is our sole standard for approval, we can easily fall into the same type of rebellion as Miriam and Aaron did, 
All right, now you think, well, what, how did this all work out? What happened? Well, let's look at Numbers 12, verses 3 and 4. Now Moses was more humble than any other person on earth. Wow, fascinating. So immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. And the three of them went out. All right, now let's stop. So through this scripture, we, glimpsed one, we, we can glimpse one of God's character requirements for his desired leaders, and that is humility. Moses was the most humble man on earth, according to God. Wow. I mean, what a compliment. But Miriam and Aaron, they probably did not share that description of him at the moment. They might have been thinking, you know, well, Moses, he's getting a little bit too big for his britches here. God, someone's got to set him, or, set him in order. So the Lord called the three of them out to the tabernacle, as the, and as the three headed out, it is quite possible, all right, Miriam maybe was like, you know, nodding to Aaron, going, you know, get ready, Moses blew it. All right, God's going to make you leader now, Aaron. <laughs> Let's see what happens here. So they're walking out to meet God in the tent, you know, and what actually happens, though, is very different. And to paraphrase the next couple of verses, all right, God called Miriam and Aaron forward, he reminded them that he had entrusted Moses with his entire house, and he spoke with Moses face to face directly. And then God poised this question in verse 8, saying this, should you not be afraid to criticize him? Remember how the Bible says that God heard what Miriam and Aaron had said about Moses? When we criticize authority, we expose a lack of the fear of the Lord. And God takes this very seriously. And I say that to myself, too. Listen to what happens in verse uh, 9 through 10 of Numbers 12. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So by resisting authority, they brought judgment on themselves. I mean, this was the only thing that, that they had done wrong, was criticize Moses. And Miriam got leprosy. I mean, this is serious to God. This is not just something to take lightly. And, a Miriam, and, and Aaron immediately cried out in repentance for, him, for himself and Miriam. And God in his mercy forgave them. But Miriam still had to be isolated from the congregation for seven days, and then she was restored. But some may, you know, may question why only Miriam became a leper and Aaron didn't. One reason could be that Miriam was maybe more forceful in her verbal attack. We don't know. Or perhaps God knew that Aaron, being the high priest, had to remain in his position with the ability to carry out his duties. But whatever the reason, this incident shows how seriously God views this matter. And I want to mention that resistance to authority, it does not always, you know, proceed from an evil heart. It's often committed out of ignorance. I mean, it, I share with you some, uh, on occasion how in my younger teenage years, I didn't really have a problem disrespecting authority. It was like, you know, oh, to, to bash the authority makes me look so cool. <laughs> you know, and that, that was just ignorance. And I had a lot of friends who were doing it too. So... But now I, it's amazing how because of the good work that God has done in me and in his mercy and in his revelation that he gives through the Holy Spirit, now I have an extra sensitivity to that. And I have an extra sensitivity to, to, to have that heart of honor and respect toward authority. And it's, it's not perfect, but it's growing. I mean, I look back, like I said, from where I was in my teenage years and go, Thank you, God. I'm, I am different. I'm a different person. I know, you know, but, th but this is a very thing that we have to understand. It's so important. And one thing is certain that Miriam never forgot her time of humiliation because it's recorded she never said anything like this ever again. However, not all turn out as Miriam and Aaron did. Others within the same congregation, <laughs> the same time frame, later rose up against God's established authority in Moses. They, they didn't repent, and it did not go well for them. And this rebellion actually started with three men in the congregation of, of, of Israel named Korah, one named Dathan, and one named Abiram. 
and they gathered together 250 leaders in the congregation. They were men of renown, actually, and they came against Moses and Aaron, and they, you can see what they said here in uh, Numbers 16, verse 3. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, this is what they said, you take too much upon yourself, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord, Moses? So in simpler words, okay, these men who were under Moses and Aaron said, uh, guys, why do you exalt yourselves as leaders over us? We are all God's people, and we can obey him without you ordering us around. <laughs> You've probably heard this type of talk before, or maybe not in these exact words, but definitely portrayed by behavior and maybe subtler words. You may hear, you know, well, we're all equal. We're all God's children. We're all brothers and sisters. We all have the Holy Spirit. Why should we have to submit to leadership? <laughs> Unfortunately, these people are convinced they can hear the Lord as well as anyone else. And, and let, me, let, me, let me preface this. God does speak to everyone, okay? He wants to talk to you every single day of your life. So I'm not trying to say that God only speaks to people in leadership. Not whatsoever. But... Remember back in Ephesians, he did give the fivefold ministry for the equipping of the saints. So there's something that he wants to share through the fivefold ministry that we have to be humble and receive from. And I say that to myself, that God, I know that you said that I have to submit to leadership because, first of all, it's a test of my, of my heart, but second, because you have something to share to me through them that I couldn't get on my own. It's, it's really interesting how God works this way. It causes us to stay humble. It causes us to stay dependent, all right, and not get too big for our britches, all right? Now, so, now, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me in this area as well, that there are people who take this concept of authority and discipleship to extreme and unbiblical realities, all right? People who think they have to, you know, ask their leader or pastor before they make any like decision like you know pastor can I go out and get a cheeseburger you know or whatever you know it's like I'm not talking about that okay or you know can I go on vacation or you know can I buy this pair of shoes please you know no I'm not trying to say that all right at all but I'm not saying that if you didn't want to ask counsel all right about a decision that you shouldn't because oftentimes it's good but you know some pastors have been domineering and manipulative about this and 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 that's not what the Bible teaches, all right? But unfortunately, and hear me when I say this, these abuses of leadership have caused a rebound in the opposite direction to many individuals. Because authority has been abused, people opt to despise it, all right? They become extreme free agents and spiritual vagabonds, I want to call them. They just, you know, they run around from, oh, this church and this church and this convention and this conference, and, you know, they end up, finally going, well, I don't like any of them, and they just start their own Bible study, and then, you know, because they couldn't find anything perfect enough for them, all right? <laughs> Whew, I'm just tired thinking about it, <laughs> you know? But remember, okay, that these men in the congregation of Israel who rose up against Moses had previously been under a pretty abusive authority of Pharaoh, all right? And then Moses stepped into their life, and his authority seemed pretty extreme as well, but maybe in a different kind of way, and at times, he brought them actually greater hardship than they had known with Pharaoh. Perhaps they reasoned that, you know, well, we're out of Egypt and Pharaoh's gone, and Moses, you know, you kind of served your purpose, and so, you know, every man for himself now. But, <laughs> yeah, you could laugh about that. But, you know, so you could say those guys had had it with authority. But after all, you know, they, they might have thought, we're all God's people, and authorities mean difficulties, and so several of them got together and they attacked Moses. And too often, Westerners have a difficulty with kingdom principles. Because a kingdom is a, is a kingdom. It has a king by virtue of birthright and appointed leadership. As opposed to a democracy which elects its rulers. All right? and, but this is, this is not the way of God's kingdom where leaders are appointed. It is called the kingdom of God. He's oftentimes... So many times Jesus referred to the kingdom, the kingdom of God. It is a kingdom with Jesus as the ultimate king, all right? Jesus appoints the offices of service, 
And no one can place a human in authority in these positions of authority except the Lord. And he does it by the Spirit of God. He really does. When we assume a position of authority without God's appointment, we exalt ourselves. All right? And this includes those who maybe are genuinely called, yet they're not in the right timing. They have yet to be appointed. All right? And Paul actually warned about this in Romans 12, verse 3. He said, For I say, through the grace given to me, to, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Even Jesus himself, get this, Jesus himself did not assume his position of leadership. His father appointed him. He said, I, and this is one of, the, one of the, you can go back and listen to this, one of the, in the, one of the first messages I taught, I showed the example of Jesus. He himself said, I do nothing unless my father tells me to do it. He said, I don't even say anything unless I hear my father say it. Jesus is the the humble servant to his dad. Even God called him my servant. I mean, Jesus. If Jesus didn't get out of it, we certainly can't. Now, my, my own parents' testimony of their journey to their position as, as pastors, you know, when they both felt like God had called them to be pastors, they, they were very humble about it, though. They didn't just, you know, run out and start doing stuff. Well, I think I've called to this. They actually submitted their lives to other men and women in positions of authority over them, you know, and then God, this is really cool, by the Holy Spirit actually used those leaders to confirm the calling that they were sensing in their hearts. My, my dad in particular has a, has a great testimony that he was, he really felt like he was called to be a pastor and, you know, but he wanted to, he really wanted to be sure and so he made an appointment with a spiritual authority in his life. And he didn't say one word about what the meeting was about. He just said, you know, can I come in and can we just talk? And the man was like, yes. And, and so, but he didn't say anything about what, he was, what was on his heart to talk about. And the moment my dad walked into the door, this is just a beautiful story. The moment my dad walked into the door of the, of, of the man's office, the man looked up and spoke this word of prophecy out of his mouth and said, before me stands a pastor. <laughs> and my dad had not told him anything about what he was going to talk about. He had no idea. And he, just, he just looked up at my dad and said, before me stands a pastor. And my dad was like, well, meeting's done. I can go home now. You know? But not really. But, you know, they talked everything. But this was, that's how God uses authority to confirm that you're supposed to be in, in, a, in, a, in a special place. And a similar situation is recorded in the book of Acts with Paul's life. You think the apostle Paul? Yeah, Paul was called to be an apostle since before he was born, obviously. We know that according to the Bible. Yet he was not placed in that office immediately after he got saved. There was a period of time where he actually submitted to the other church leaders at the city of Antioch. And at a certain time, the Holy Spirit then revealed to the leaders around him that Paul was called to be an apostle, and he was released into his ministry. And that's recorded, recorded in Acts 13. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. But let's go back to the story here about Korah and Dathan and Abiram, because they opposed Moses, all right, who had definitely been appointed. And the manifestation of his authority was evident to all. But these men's reasoning was a deceptive and dangerous form of rebellion. It was deceptive in the sense that they still believed they were serving God through their rebellion. Really serious. The 250 leaders had convinced themselves that they were merely opposing Moses and Aaron. They did not have the slightest inkling that their resistance extended to God. Somewhere they lost their way, and losing sight of God's authority on Moses gave them fuel to rise up against him. Because remember what I started out that verse with. It's in Romans 13. It says, those who resist the authority are resisting the ordinance of God. And they're resisting then God himself. And Numbers, thir uh, excuse me, Numbers 16, 24 through 35 records what happened next. The Lord instructed Moses, tell all the people, this is very fascinating, tell all the people to get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. So Moses told the people, Get away from the tents of these wicked men and don't touch anything that belongs to them. If you do, you will be destroyed for their sins. 
So all the people stood back from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses said, By this you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things that I have done. For I have not done them on my own. If these men die a natural death, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord performs a miracle, and the ground opens up and swallows them, and all their belongings, and they go down alive into the grave, then you will know that these men have despised the Lord. And he had hardly finished speaking these words when the ground suddenly split open beneath them, and the earth swallowed them along with their households and followers who were standing with them and everything that they owned. And the earth closed over them, and they all vanished. Severe, the severe end of those men leaves us with two sobering facts. First, they really believed they were still serving God when in reality they were opposing him. And second, in the New Testament, Jude actually refers back to this story and warned that there would be similar people in the church in the last days. And let's read this together in uh, Jude chapter 1. Likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, they have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and have perished in the rebellion of Korah. All right. Wow. There's the Korah. The Holy Spirit thought this was important enough to inspire Jude to write this. It was to show us the strategy of the enemy that moves us into speaking evil of authority figures and rejecting their authority. The influence of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram's rebellion was so persuasive that even after witnessing, even after witnessing the earth swallowing these men alive, the congregation didn't get the message of how deadly their rebellion was. I mean, really? I mean, if you saw the earth open, people go down into the earth and the earth close up, wouldn't you think, I'm not going to do what they just did? <laughs> Uh, no, the next day, okay, the entire congregation rose up against Moses and Aaron and accused them for what happened to the, leader, to the people who had, been, who had been rebelling. Then because of the congregation's rebellion, a plague broke out in the camp and 14,700 people died, right? This is to be a strong warning to us all. Rebellion is contagious and it's deadly, the Bible does not say that God dislikes rebellion. The Bible does not say that God dislikes rebellion. The scripture makes it clear that he hates it. Okay? <laughs> Remember back how God instructed Moses to tell the people to get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? I believe this is a crucial point to bring out because association with a rebellious person is a death wish. <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> my, when I was telling my dad about this message, he's like, oh yeah, you could call it do this and not die. <laughs> or do this and then die. <laughs> you know? So, and, and you know, it's, it's very true. But for this reason, Paul's final words of exhortation to the church in Rome were this, and I'd love to sh show you this on the screen in Romans 16, 17 through 18. He says, and now I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters. Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Wow. Verse 18. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interests. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. Wow. Wow. And this is confirmed also in Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. And it says this, If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like them have turned away from the truth, and their own sins condemn them. 
Wow. God warns us to stay away from people who are bringing divisions in the body of Christ. I admit this command is not very popular. It's really not. We don't like to be told to actually avoid certain kinds of people. But the Bible says this not to be mean or, or you know, unkind, but it's for your own spiritual health and safety. And listen to this verse in Romans 11, uh, verses 21 through 22. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity. But towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Wow. So God is a good God, but he is to be respected. In fact, there's, I don't have this, but I just, I'm just thinking of it at the moment. But it's that verse that said, it's, it's a beautiful verse. It actually talks about how people will actually fear the Lord because of his goodness. He is to be respected. One of the greatest ways you can show respect for God is to respect authority. And this affects what we say, what we do, and how we act, and how we think. And as I close today, I want to read this last verse to you in Ephesians chapter 6, 5 through 8. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, with sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. So what I want to showcase in that verse to you as we close today, and my final thoughts to you here, that when you respect authority, you are showing respect for the Lord, and he rewards it, okay? No matter if that authority, we've talked about how you deal with harsh authorities, you deal with ungodly authorities. We're going to continue to talk about it more in the weeks to come. But as that verse said, when you do that goodwill from the heart, God sees it. You don't have to have the reward of men. He goes, I saw when you honored that, that, that authority figure. I saw when you honored your, your mother and father. I saw when you honored your pastor. I saw when you honored those in political places of authority. I saw that. And I will reward you. Because he sees it. And those, it's a beautiful verse that I was reminded of today as I was praying and seeking the Lord. He said, those who honor me, God's saying this, those who honor me, I will honor. When you give God honor through honoring authority and honoring obviously God as the ultimate authority, he honors you. And this message today is <laughs> like, a, like a vaccine against rebellion. <laughs> it's like the type of message that will save your life <laughs> and bring many benefits if you will accept it. So I pray that you will today. And let's, let's pray together today as, as we finish here. Because I just want to, I want to pray because I know this is difficult. And, and sometimes it's like, sometimes you see an authority and you go, Ay, 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 you know, Lord, what do I do? Or, you know, you see, especially out in the world, people who maybe, maybe your boss or your, you know, uh, someone that you know in, in a political position or, or even just uh, authority in, the, in the, the marketplace or in your home, maybe even your own parents or, God forbid, your pastor. But, I mean, just anybody, you're going, Lord, I need the grace. I need the grace for honor. And I want to pray for you today for this because it's something that God wants to give you. God never asked you to do anything that he doesn't provide the ability for you to do it. So he's going to give you that today, I believe, by faith. So let's, let's pray this together. Just however you want to do it. If you want to close your eyes, if you want to fold your hands, I don't, you want to, if you want to pray with your eyes open, I don't care. But let's just all enter into this now as we pray together. And just, just, uh, just pray this in your heart as I pray it out loud. Oh, Lord, help us to respect you in all we do, God. Forgive us for any times we have spoken out against authority figures. We realize that this is wrong and is showing you dishonor. 
Show us more about how to live with an honoring spirit, God, with a respectful heart. We ask for you, Holy Spirit, to watch over our words, to give us self-control in our speech, because we know that you're listening. You hear it. So Lord, pour out your love in our hearts so we can have humility and respect for you and for your leaders that you have appointed. Thank you, God, for your, your promise of blessing and rewards for those who walk this way. We want to be those who receive those rewards and avoid destruction. So Lord, help us do this today. We receive the grace for this. We, we receive the grace that you're giving, this, giving to us for this right now. In Jesus' name we pray.